Okay guys, this is part two of the video on prepotency and dog breeding. So in part one we talked about natural selection, artificial selection, and how training and testing and raising has an effect. For example, if you raise the puppies and you give them an enriched environment, you give them obstacles to climb, you give them a puppy chute to go through, like for agility, I don't know if you saw those, you make them go through the agility chute, you make them climb up stairs to make them self-confident. How much of their behavior was because you exposed them to early neurological stimulation and an enriched environment, and how much of their behavior is genetic? Could you take a dog which is not as genetically gifted but giving them an enriched environment and make the dog come out better than a dog with superior genetics? You probably could, and that's the old, old age-old question, nature versus nurture. How much of the animal's behavior is nature and how much of the animal's behavior is nurture? I would argue, and I can't speak as a veterinarian or as an animal behaviorist or as a biologist, I would argue in human beings, nurture is about 80% and nature is about 20%. Because of our tremendous brain capacity and our ability to learn and master language and master mathematics and master multiple subjects, your success in learning something and making a career and having an educational path has a greater path in how you evolve in society than your genetics. Your genetics probably control heart disease or liver disease or cancer. It controls your biological ability and certain diseases and inheritance. It doesn't have as much of an influence on your behavior as much as how you were raised and the socioeconomic um, circumstances under which you've been raised under. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Trading Places with uh, Eddie Murphy, but I think you get the idea. You take a person to an enriched environment and they behave uh, differently. I think in animals, I think it's the reverse. I think because animals are based on instincts, nature is about 80% of the behavior and nurture is about 20% of the behavior. A lot of the behavior of an animal is genetic. For example, a dog digging. It doesn't have to be taught to dig, it just digs because dogs have programmed to dig. Or a dog chasing a ball or a car, prey drive. That's not learned, that's natural to the animal. Or a hound dog following a scent, or a bird dog pointing at a bird. Uh, the behavior is so intrinsic to that breed and that animal, it's not trained, it's purely genetic behavior of a particular breed. So a pointer dog like an Irish setter, doesn't have to be trained to point, it's genetically pointing. So I would argue that nature has a greater effect than nurture in animals, and I would believe the opposite would be true in human beings. We could debate that point, but I think something along these lines is probably true. Now, the point of this video is not to discuss human beings versus dogs. The point of this video is to discuss dogs, but I think you have to make analogies to other things we understand in order to understand what's going on. Now, so, what does this mean in breeding animals? Well, in breeding a breed of dog, any breed of dog, whether it's the Bordeaux, whether it's the Caucasian Apcharka, whether it's the German Shepherd, whether it's the Laika, the Poodle, the Greyhound, you name it. Any breed of dog which has been around for 100 or 150 years or more, the goal is to create the lowest COI possible. COI stands for the coefficient of inbreeding. C-O-I. There's another term, coefficient of relationship. Coefficient of relationship. Or C-O-R. 
both terms are important and we're going to uh, mention a mathematician we mentioned last time which is Siebel Wright who wrote an equation in 1922 describing coefficient of inbreeding. Now there were other scientists behind after him but the scientist worth mentioning the most is Hardingman and I believe he wrote an equation in 2000 and I'll explain so that's about 80 years, 78 years between this equation and this equation I'm going to go into that in a minute but the father of coefficient of inbreeding I would say would be uh, civil right, just like Mendel is the father of genetics. So now, if you are creating using an existing breed, your goal is to create a COI below 5%. In other words, if you have an existing breed, your goal is to keep your COI as low as possible. To breed unrelated dogs or dogs only related in the sixth or seventh generation in the past. Um, Hardyman's equation only goes up to five generations. So past six generations, the inbreeding coefficient is so small, it doesn't even count. Those dogs might as well be unrelated. So in the existing breed, you want to keep diversity high. To keep diversity high, you have to have a low inbreeding coefficient. However, if you have a low inbreeding coefficient, that's exactly the opposite of what you want to do when you're creating a breed. When you are having an existing breed, you want to keep the COI low when you're trying to create a new breed you want to create a COI high Again, if you want to create a new breed, you want to create a high COI. If you have an existing breed, you want to keep a low COI. Now, what do you get with a high COI? A high COI gives you what is called heterogazygous genes versus homozygous genes. So let me take a minute to explain that because uh, we have to go a little bit into biology in order to explain these concepts without which you cannot understand these concepts. Let's say you have two human beings and you have uh, a parent with brown eyes. And brown eyes we're going to write as capital BB. Now, uh, dominant genes are written with capital letters and recessive genes are written with lowercase letters. That's how the uh, notation works. Then you have a parent with blue eyes. Which we're going to write as lowercase b or lowercase b. Now you have to have both recessives for the child to be born with blue eyes. Now, I have light blue eyes. Both my mother and my father had blue eyes. My wife has brown eyes. What would our children look like based on the fact that I have blue eyes and my wife has brown eyes? Well, we're going to do something called a Punnett square. kind of looks like a tic-tac-toe box and 
and we're going to write my wife as capital B and capital B, brown and brown. She's brown-eyed. I'm going to write myself as blue and blue. Blue eyes. I have blue eyes. Now, did your father have blue eyes? Oh. Blue yeah, eyes, right? Green. Okay, well, we're going to say he had blue eyes for the sake of this example. So, he had blue eyes, okay? Now, the first combination will be this one. Capital B, lowercase b. What will this child look like? Brown eyes, because you only need one dominant to be expressed. You don't need two. But in a recessive case, you need both genes for it to be expressed. So the dominant gene masks the recessive gene. The other child will be the same way. Capital B, lowercase b. Again, it will be brown, but carries blue. This child will be blue eyes, and this child will be blue eyes. So, 50% of the kids will be brown eyes, but carry blue as the recessive, and 50% of the kids will have blue eyes. Now, we only have two kids, one has brown and one has blue. So, kind of worked out. <laughs> but if we had four kids, that's how it would work statistically speaking. So you see how a dominant works with a recessive? You have to have both copies of the recessive to make it come true, but only one copy of the dominant to make it come true. And dominant is written with a capital letter and recessive is written with a lowercase letter. Now, in the earlier video we talked about different combinations of inbreeding and line breeding. We wrote 2-2 two, two, half siblings common father or mother half siblings three three first cousins once removed four four second cousins once removed And five five third cousins once removed. And if we look at it mathematically in terms of C O R, not C O I, this becomes one half squared, the relationship becomes the power. 2 becomes the power, plus 1 half squared, <coughs> 1 half squared is 1 fourth, and 1 half squared is another 1 fourth, so this becomes 2 fourths or 1 half. Well, that's what you expect. You have a common father, which is 50% of both kids, right? Two different moms, two different moms, you know, one, si one sire, mom 1, mom 2, it creates kids with the each female. The kids are 50% the same male, right? That's what you expect, right? So notice how the power is the relationship distance. 3-3, three, three, common grandfather, three generations back in time. One half cubed plus one half cubed. One half cubed is one eighth. One eighth plus one eighth is two eighths. Two eighths is one fourth. Well, 25%, this is 50%. Well, that's right. The grandfather is 25% of the genes of his kids, right? Because there are four grandparents maternal grandfather, maternal grandmother, paternal grandfather paternal grandmother. 
four grandparents. One of the four <laughs> grandparents is common to both sides, so the relationship is one-fourth. He's one of three other grandparents where his blood is common, so that makes sense. Right? One-fourth is 25%. Great-great-grandfather, four generations back. One-half to the fourth power plus one-half to the fourth power which is 1 16th plus 1 16th, which becomes 2 16th, and 2 16th is 1 8th, and that's right. Four generations back, there are eight grandparents, so he becomes 1 8th of that total list of grandparents in terms of passing out on his genes. Fifth power, 1 half to the fifth power, plus 1 half to the fifth power, 132nd plus 132nd, which is 232nds, and so forth. In other words, the way you calculate the coefficient of relationship is to raise one half. Why one half? Because it's half the relationship, not the whole relationship. And that's how you get the coefficient of relationship based on the ancestor. Um, now that we talked about the potential inbreeding and line breeding relationships, let's talk about different strategies. That will be in part three.